just go over some of that, that material. It's not very, really very much to say to finish it off, uh, and then be done with the same on effect. Um, so in particular, it's fairly easy. It's quite easy, actually, uh, to find the energy shifts in the, in the case of a, of a weak field, weak magnetic field, in the form given here. It's a Bohr magnet times the magnetic field multiplied by uh, some dimensionless numbers. And the hard part of evaluating this is the matrix element of the spin operator, the sequence part of the spin. And these uh, quantum numbers here represent the quantum numbers of, a, of an atomic state of an atom with a single electron. So hydrogen or an alkali atom is the idea. And this is the usual quantum numbers for that. So it's in evaluating this final matrix element that we use the projection theorem. Now, I think last time I, I did a, an all right job of explaining um, how the projection theorem is derived from Dirac's identity. I didn't prove the identity, but if you believe it, then it's fairly easy to derive um, this result here for the projection theorem. This is written in the general terminology in which gamma j and m are um, elements of a standard angular momentum basis for an arbitrary system, where j is the total angular momentum. Uh, and then, um, so, so we have to change notation to identify it with the quantum numbers that you see above, specifically for the Zeeman effect. But what I'd like to do now, something I didn't have time for uh, last Wednesday, is to explain why it's called the projection theorem, because that also helps you uh, understand the theorem and you need to remember it in case you're on the desert island. Desert island sometime and can't remember it. So it works like this. Is, uh, the first thing to notice about the projection theorem is that it's actually a fairly special result in the way I presented it, because it's not an arbitrary pair of standard angular momentum basis vectors in the two sides. Uh, rather, uh, it's required that the J values in the two sides be equal. Uh, however, as far as the gamma and the M's are concerned, those are allowed to be different. So as I say, it's a rather special result. There is a generalization of this theorem that allows also the J values to be distinct, but we won't need it for this course, and it's more complicated, and so I won't go into it. You can find it in Condon shortly if you want to look in that book. In any case, the J then is the same on both sides, and the other quantum numbers are different. So here's a classical interpretation of this that helps you remember it, and also uh, helps you understand why it's called a projection theorem. Uh, let's suppose we treat the operator A, the vector operator A, and the angular momentum of J as if they were just classical vectors. So A is just a vector that sticks off here like this in some direction and J is another vector that goes off in another direction. Now, if you wanted to project A onto J, what you do is you drop the perpendicular down like this. And let's call that projection, let's call it, uh, let's call it A parallel, meaning the component of A that's in the same direction as J. Well, then just classically, just by simple geometry, A parallel is the same thing as A dotted into J, uh, multiplied times J, uh, divided by J squared. J over J squared, J over magnitude of J is just the unit vector in this direction, and all you're doing is taking the component of that unit vector and then multiplying by the unit vector itself. That's just what this means. So this is just simple vector geometry to see this. Now, what the quantum mechanical projection theorem says is that the matrix elements of the original vector between angular momentum states where the J value is the same on both sides, so it's a subspace of fixed angular momentum is the same thing as the matrix elements of the projection. The only thing you have to remember is that the classical J squared that appears here needs to be replaced by J times J plus one, which is the usual quantum mechanical eigenvalue of the operator J squared. And then, and then you see this is what you get on the right hand side. It's very frequently useful because it's often it's much easier to find matrix elements of J than it is of the original vector. And there's usually tricks you can do to take care of the dot product. So, just as an example for the S to Z here, what this says is, is that what the, what the projection theorem says, if I apply it, is that this matrix element, and now what we need to do is to identify the gamma here with the N and L. The J is the same as the J here, and the M is the same as the MJ. It's a change of notation. So, by the projection theorem, this is the same thing as NLJ, MJ on one side. Uh, and then we have S dotted into J. And then we've got uh, JZ. I'm taking the Z component of this general formula and identifying A with the spin. That's what I'm doing. And then NLJ, MJ on the other side. Uh, and then uh, this is divided by J times J plus 1. <coughs> in this particular use application of projection theorem, the N and L on one side is the same as the N and L on the other side. Although in the formula, we have a primer allowed to be the same. It's the same thing about the M's and M primes. The M's and M primes, by the way, are the same in this, in, this, in this formula here because 
uh, because uh, the uh, Joseph Z commutes with the perturbing Hamiltonian, and so it's diagonal in, 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 uh, in M sub, M sub J of the perturbation. But once you've got it to this stage, then the JZ J part is easy because that just brings out an MJ. It's acting on an eigenstate of itself. And as far as S dot J is concerned, you use a trick. You write, you write the orbital angular moment L is equal to J minus S, like this. But then you square both sides, and you get L squared is equal to J squared plus S squared minus twice uh, S dotted into J. So you concoct it so that you get the particular dot product you're interested in. <clears throat> and then, so solving for s dot j is one half j squared plus s squared minus l squared. And so this s dot j can be written this way. It becomes the same as this operator, one half uh, j squared plus s squared minus l squared. However, this operator is now sandwiched between states which are eigenstates of j squared, l squared, and s squared is a constant operator. So it just turns into a number, which is the same thing as one half of uh, J times J plus 1 plus S times S plus 1 minus L times L plus 1. And S times S plus 1 returns the same thing as 3 quarters because it refers to the spin of the electron, so it's 1 half times 3 halves. So in any case, you now just put the algebra together and you get the, the land of G factor. This is, this is the uh, outline of the, uh, of the application of the projection theorem for the weak field Z line effect. <coughs> Yes, sorry. I've lost track of the overarching theme um, from one lecture to the next. So I have no. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, maybe no, you, yeah, maybe I, you would have remembered it if I come on Friday last <laughs> week. <laughs> no, it's just that. So I have no recollection of, like, I mean, this is stupid, but I guess for starters, did this come from the Zeeman effect? Yes, this is the end of the Zeeman effect. And if you look at the notes on the Zeeman effect, this is like right at the end of the notes. And I think it's, I think it's actually all explained in the notes. But um, the, uh, this is the weak field Zeeman effect, which in some sense is the most difficult uh, of, of them all. And um, uh, you uh, basically you um, uh, you have uh, the the energy the eigenstates are degenerate. They're basically um, they're just characterized by the angular momentum value, and the M, Mj is what determines the degeneracy. So it's 2j plus 1 for each other. And so, if this is a this is an example of the general perturbation theory, but as as all always seems to happen, we get by with non degenerate perturbation theory because the matrix is diagonal. It's di in this case, it's diagonal in some J. So I, I'm, I'm indeed I'm, I've skipped a, I skipped steps leading up to this, but those are those were done in the last Wednesday's lecture. Right. right. Take a look at the notes because you'll see it's, it's it's I think I think <coughs> that part of the notes explains right. it. I do recall that. But then now we're saying okay, so now we have. Somehow from that, we have like a theorem that's generally applicable to things more. Yes, in fact, I'll show you in just a moment if we have time. Uh, that I'll show you several more applications of the projection theorem. But the uh, but you see, this this matrix element is difficult to evaluate because the J and J is involved such thermal coefficients combining orbital and spin angular momentum. And this S of Z it only refers to one part of that. So this, if I were to expand this out and clutch thermal coefficients, I get a linear combination of terms for each one of these. And then indeed it would be, it would be easy to let SC act on them because each term would, would be an eigenstate of S of C. But then you get a whole bunch of terms and such Gordon coefficients multiplied by things, and it's a lot of algebra to do it. So this is actually much easier. So do it this way. This allows you to transfer the Z component from S over to J, which helps because the you have eigenstates of J and Z. Okay? Okay. okay. Now, uh, so if you got that, I'm going to cover it up because I'm going to start a new topic. The new topic is going to use the projection theorem a fair amount. Uh, I want to turn to the subject of the Deuteron and do a, just a little bit of nuclear physics. Um, it's really quite interesting. Uh, so uh, to begin with, the Deuteron is a bound state of the proton and the neutron. If I call it the neutron uh, dark, it looks like this. So there's a proton and a neutron. Each of these, of course, is a spin one half particle. And the Deuteron is a, is a bound state of that. Now, uh, the proton and the neutron are held together by the strong forces. And uh, so let me say something uh, first about the strong forces uh, and how they uh, contrast with electromagnetic forces. One of the main differences is that the electromagnetic forces uh, are considered long range. That's because the Coulomb potential falls off as 1 over r. It doesn't have any natural scale in the sense the scale is infinity. And it's also considered a rather slow, slow decay uh, of the force. 
on the other hand, the nuclear forces, uh, roughly speaking, fall off exponentially. Um, I have to say roughly, this is only a crude statement because it's, it's the idea, the idea is the potential falls off exponentially. And in fact, as we'll see, the, the interaction between the proton and neutron is, is, is only roughly described by a potential. If you push the accuracy, it is, it's not even a potential. Nevertheless, it's useful to think that way about them. And uh, so it has an exponential decay and therefore a scale length, which is the <coughs> scale length of the decay. And what is that scale length? Uh, the nuclear forces, it's roughly about one fermi. Uh, one fermi is defined to be 10 to the minus uh, 13 centimeters. And uh, the, um, so anything involving the range of the nuclear forces comes out as a, as a small multiple of, of one fermi. Uh, notice that this is about 10 to the fifth times smaller than the size of the atom, so the nucleus is of that, of that relative size. Its volume, of course, is that cube, so it's 10 to the minus 15. It's a really very small volume in the, uh, in the atom. It's proportionally higher density. The density is 10 to the 15 higher than the density of, of the atom, which is approximately the density of ordinary matter. Nuclear matter is much, much more dense than ordinary matter. Well, in any case, uh, that's the arrangement of nuclear forces. Now, um, uh, I mean, for example, just to give you an example of what this means, if you, by studying um, experiments that have uh, studied um, electrons scattering off of protons to probe the internal structure of the protons, and determine what's called a form factor and allow you to get information about the charge distribution inside the proton. And this comes out with a, an RMS charge radius for the proton that's something like about 0 0.8 Fermi. It's only an RMS value, so in a sense the charge continues out beyond that, out to some you know, something above one fermi, but it gives you an idea of the order of magnitude. All right. Now, um, the, uh, the, uh, so those are some facts about the strong forces. Here's some more facts. The strong forces are strong. Uh, that means they're stronger than the electromagnetic forces. Uh, one can see this, for example, in the case of the alpha particle, which of course is a, is a nucleus of helium. It has two protons and two electrons, uh, two neutrons. Neutrons are neutral, but the protons are positive, and so they repel each other by the Coulomb force. Now, the electric force uh, it, uh, goes as the inverse square of the distance, and since this distance is 10 to the minus 10 to the fifth times smaller than the size of an atom, it means the force which repels those two pro pushing those two protons apart is uh, something like 10 to the tenth times as large as the attractive force between the proton and the electron in the hydrogen atom. It's really quite a strong force. It just made it as a short distance. But nevertheless, the alpha particle is a balanced state, and it is so because in spite of that strong repulsion, the nuclear forces are even stronger and hold the proton and the, and the neutron, neutrons together in the alpha particle. So this is, the, this is the sense in which they're considered strong. <coughs> All right. Now, um, specifically, uh, specifically about the, uh, oh yes, one more thing I should say is that the strong forces, as it turns out, are actually independent of the, well, the, the distinction between the proton and the neutron is sometimes referred to as this charge state. It's a neutral one and another one's positive. But the strong forces between these two particles are, in fact, independent of the charge state. So the force between two protons is the same as the force between a proton and a neutron. The strong forces don't care about the difference between those two particles. Of course, the electromagnetic forces do. Uh, and in fact, in the analysis of such phenomena, electromagnetic forces are often taken as a small perturbation on top of the strong forces. All right. Anyway, the equality of the, of the nuclear forces between protons and neutrons is the beginning of isospin symmetry, which I won't have time to go into. But it's a uh, it's a basic uh, uh, it's a basic a structural fact about nuclear physics. All right. Now. Um, <coughs> To uh, turn to the deuteron specifically, let me give you some experimental facts about it. Uh, since it's a bound state of the two, we can picture it as the two kind of stuck together like this. It obviously has a charge of the proton, which is one half. It's a heavy isotope of hydrogen. Uh, the, uh, we can guess that the average separation between them is on the order of a, of a, of a fermi. As it turns out, it's actually somewhat larger than that because of tunneling into the classically forbidden region. Um, here's some more experimental facts. It turns out that the spin of the deuteron, uh, which is normally denoted, the operator is normally denoted by I, uh, the spin of the deuteron is actually, uh, is actually physically speaking, it's the sum of the spins of the proton and the neutron plus the orbital angular momentum between them. 
By the way, the masses of the proton and neutron are almost equal. Uh, so uh, what you have is a picture, classically, of two nearly equal mass objects rotating around each other. It's like a dumbbell turning about its common center of mass, which is halfway, halfway between the two, the two particles. Uh, so in any case, there's, in general, there's both orbital angular momentum and spin. And we can write the total angular momentum of Deuteron this way as, as L plus, let's call it S1 plus S2, where 1 and 2 refer to the proton and the neutron. This is the optic spin operator. Let's denote the eigenvalue value around the quantum number of the operator I squared by I, so that the value of I squared is taken as I times I plus 1. Now, it's an experimental, it's an experimental result that the uh, spin of the Deuteron is 1. That is to say that the quantum number I is equal to 1, but the operator I squared goes into 1 times 2, which is 2. It has a numerical value of 2. All right. Uh, <coughs> This means, um, this means, so uh, if the numerical, if this total, if the value of the total spin is equal to two, we can now use the rules for addition of angular momenta to get some idea on the restrictions of the quantum numbers for L squared, S1 squared, and S2 squared. Uh, by the way, let's do this. Let's write S for the total spin is equal to S1 plus S2. It's a total spin of the proton plus the neutron. So that we have I is just equal to L plus S, like this. A simple equation. So the total values of the quantum number s, I'll call it lowercase s, I'll try to make it small, is that lowercase s can either equal 0 or 1 because you're combining a half with a half. The 0 is the singlet state, but that, that, the, the 0 is the singlet state, and uh, the, the 1 is the triplet state if you count the number of magnetic substates. <coughs> this is a, concerns the total spin. So the total spin quantum number is therefore either 0, zero or 1, and then L, L takes on the usual orbital angular momentum values. So if I make a table here of the different allowed L and S values, the one that I read is quantum numbers, L times S. And first of all, S could be equal to 0. Just, just based on the rules for addition of angular momenta, S could be 0. And if S is 0, then we must have L equals 1 in order to get a value of I, which is equal to 1. That's the only way you could get 1 out of, out of the spin 0. However, if the spin were equal to 1, if you were in a triplet state, then the orbital angular momentum could either be 0, 1, or 2, insofar as the rules for addition of angular momentum are concerned, because that's what you have to need in order to reach a final value of 1 for the total angular momentum. So this is a table of possible L and S values based purely on the rules for addition of angular momentum. As we'll see in a moment, these get restricted by further considerations, and it ends up there's a, a fewer, fewer set of possibilities than the ones that are in that table. Here's a, so this is, a, this is a result, the consequence of the experimental value of the spin of the deuteron. Here's some other experimental facts. The uh, ground state of the deuteron has an energy of about minus 2.2 MeV. This is actually a rather small uh, binding energy for nuclei. Uh, the alpha particle has a, uh, it takes considerably more energy to remove a nucleon from an alpha particle. So they, in a sense, from the standpoint of nuclear physics, the deuteron is rather weakly bound. Uh, another experimental fact is, is that this is the only bound state that the deuteron has. It has no excited states. If you try to, no, no bound excited states. If you try to um, excite it, all you do is break it apart and it turns into uh, an unbound uh, proton and neutron. This, of course, becomes a scattering state for the, uh, for the system. So unlike hydrogen, which has an infinite number of bound states, the deuteron, the most simple nuclear problem, has only one. All right. And finally, here's another experimental fact. It has, uh, the deuteron has a g factor, g sub e, which is equal to 0 0.857, uh, determined uh, nicely by magnetic resonance experiments where high accuracy is possible. What this means is, is that the magnetic moment operator for the deuteron is equal to g sub e times the nuclear magneton times the total spin operator, total angular momentum operator for the neuron divided by h bar, where the nuclear magneton, as usual, is equal to e h bar divided by twice the proton mass times the speed of light. This is the standard unit for magnetic moments of nuclei. <coughs> All right. OK. So what I'd like to do now is to take these experimental facts and then try to gather as much information as we can about um, the wave function of the neuron 
uh, and the quantum mechanics of it using, using the rules of quantum mechanics. All right. So, in the first place, uh, it would be a simple guess that the interaction between the proton and the neutron is described by a potential. It would have to be a central force potential in order for the uh, system to be rotationally invariant. And if that's so, we have a simple central force Hamiltonian, e squared over 2m plus potential V of R. This is really the this is really a relative this is the Hamiltonian for the relative motion, so the M here is really the mu, it's the reduced mass of the proton neutron system. But anyway, let's take this as a guess as a starting point for what the interaction might be, without, without knowledge of what the potential V of R is. Uh, let's, let's see what some of the consequences are. Well, here's one of the consequences. If we look at the radial wave equation, as you know, the potential, the effective potential is the sum of the true plus the centrifugal. The true potential must be some kind of a well in order to do the bound state, so let's just sketch, sketch a well here. And the centrifugal dep potential depends on the angular momentum, but it's always positive. It's, it's, it's L times L plus 1 h bar squared divided by 2 mu r squared. So it's always a positive potential. It, it goes to plus infinity as r goes to 0. Uh, if L is equal to 0, the centrifugal potential vanishes, and then you just have the true potential, that's all. But in any case, you can see that when you add the true potential to the centrifugal potential, we'll get a curve that comes down like this and may get below zero, and then it's going to asymptote to zero like so. We'll create a well like this. And if there's a bound state in that well, it's going to be some bound state that looks like that, some energy. But the fact that the centrifugal potential is an increasing function of L means that the absolute ground state of the system is always going to be an S wave. It's going to be one for which L equals zero. This is true for any central force Hamiltonian. Of course, we know it's an S wave for hydrogen. But you see, it's a general argument that applies for any central force Hamiltonian. And since a deuteron has only one, one bound state, this is, this is the ground state, that ground state must be an S wave. That follows inevitably from this assumption of a central force Hamiltonian. Now, actually, we'll see in a minute that this is really not adequate to describe the, uh, the deuteron. There's more, there's more to it. But if we accepted this, then it must follow that we have an S wave. And so what we conclude is, is that L must be equal to zero. And if L is equal to zero, then the spin must be one. That is to say, the total angular momentum has to come from just the spin part, because the L is not contributing. Since I is equal to one, then S must be equal to one. And we're in a spin triplet state. That's what that means. So in particular, it would mean the wave function psi, psi would look like this. It would be a radial wave function that's called R of R. And then a y0 zero and 0 of omega because that's L equal 0. And then what you have is for the total spin and the total magnetic quantum number of spin, or let me write the operators as S squared and S and Z, you'd have quantum numbers 1 and, and M sub S. It would look like this. The M sub S is the same thing here as M sub I uh, since, uh, since L is 0. Uh, and, uh, and this gives us a state of total, total angular momentum 1, which is the same as spin 1. Okay. All right. Now, <clears throat> uh, the next question uh, I'd like to turn to, in fact, most of what I'll be talking about in the next 45 minutes is, uh, is uh, magnetic moments. So let me turn to the magnet, question of magnetic moments. The, Magnetic moments of the proton and neutron can be measured uh, separately in, uh, as separate particles. And for the proton, the answer is it's g is five, the g factor is 5.588, and the g factor for the neutron is minus 3.823. Uh, it's negative. This means that the magnetic moment for the proton is equal to the g proton times the nuclear magneton times this, let's say, s1 over h bar, where s1 Tell you what, I'm going to start setting h bar equals to 1 to say right, so I'll just put an S1 here. S1 refers to the proton. And likewise, the magnetic moment of the neutron is the g factor of the neutron times the nuclear magneton times S2. Like this. Now, uh, the question is, can we understand the experimentally measured value of the g factor of the deuteron 0.857 in terms of the g factors of the protons, the proton and the neutron. Make it up. This is the magnetic moment of the deuteron coming purely from the combined magnetic moments of the two constituent particles. 
So how do we analyze that? Well, if we have our proton and neutron in, in orbit around each other, and we uh, we put the system in an external magnetic field, and there's going to be a delta H perturbing Hamiltonian involved in the field, and it's going to be this. It's going to be minus the. It's going to have two terms. It'll be minus mu dot b, but but one from the uh, one from the uh, yeah one from the proton, one from the neutron right here. So this is going to turn into minus mu sub n. This is a common factor of mu n. And then there's g proton s1 plus g neutron s2 dotted in magnetic field B. Or if we put the magnetic field in the z direction, then it becomes the magnitude of B times mu n, which of course is an energy. And then we get gp times s1z plus gn times s2z. And now, uh, if we wish to uh, find the uh, find the uh, the uh, uh, the energy shifts in the magnetic field, these will be the perturbing Hamiltonian sandwiched around the eigenstates of the deuteron, the ground state eigenstates. So those ground those ground state eigenstates, are under the under the conclusion we reached earlier. Are, they've got a fixed radial wave function in, in, in angular one, and the only thing that changes is the, is the S squared SC. And S squared, by the way, is the same thing as I here because L is equal to zero. I think I'll call these ground state wave functions I n sub I. But the eigenstate of I is the same thing as the eigenstate of total S. So it's the same, this is really the same thing as S, S, and Z, referring to total spin. Uh, so this is because now you see I is just equal to S1 plus S2 since L is equal to zero. So what is this matrix, matrix element? Uh, you see it's going to be minus V mu sub nuclear magneton times the magnetic field. And then we've got I M I on one side and then G proton S1Z plus G neutron S2Z. Uh, times I M I on the other side. So we need to evaluate this matrix solver. Now, this is straightforward to evaluate by expanding out the I M I in terms of clutch Gordon coefficients and then just V force charging through it. But it's easier to use a projection theorem. So let me do that for you. Um, let's focus on, the, first of all, the matrix elements of S1 Z, which is the Z component of the scale of the photon. So this, let's look at this matrix called I M I sandwich around S one Z. Now by the projection theorem, this is equal to I M I sandwiched around the total operator I dotted into S S one uh, times uh, times I I sub Z I M I divided by I times I plus one. Using the projection The IZ part is, is now easy because it just becomes MI. It brings out the magnetic quantum number. The ground state of the deuteron is threefold degenerate because of the magnetic quantum numbers. Uh, as far as the I dot S1 is concerned, here's what we do. Let's take the I here. This formula applies in the case when L is equal to zero. And let's solve for S2. So we get S2 is equal to I minus S1. And if we square both sides, we get S2 squared is I squared plus S1 squared minus twice I dot into S1. And thereby, you see, we get the dot product we want up here. S1 squared and S2 squared are the squares of the spin operators for the protons and the neutrons. Those are constant. In fact, both of them are three quarters because it's a spin over spin on that particles. So those two terms cancel. And what we get simply is that I dotted into S1 is the same thing as a one half i squared. And so this thing, this first, this first factor then goes over into one half of i squared, which because it's acting on eigenstates of i squared, turns into <coughs> one half of i times i plus one. And the i i plus one cancels the denominator. And uh, the, the overall result of this whole thing is this, is this just becomes one half of i i. So that's the expectation value of S1Z. 
And by a very similar analysis with S2, so you get a half, do a factor and a half there as well. And so the result is, is that this becomes minus mu n d times one half of g p plus g n uh, times x of i. And what this shows you is, is that the g factor of the Duberon, if, it's, if it is indeed coming purely from the spins of the protons and the neutrons, <coughs> maybe the spins, would just be the average of the g factors for the proton and the neutron. Well, where are my numbers? Uh, here's the numbers for the proton and neutron. If you do them, do, do them and you add them up and divide by two, here's what you get is you get 0 0.883. which, as you see, is close to the experimental value of 0.857, but it's too large. It's off by a certain amount. And so what this indicates is that the, um, this, is, this, this conclusion follows inevitably from the assumption that, uh, that we have a central force Hamiltonian, because that led to the conclusion that the ground state was an S-wave, and then once you've got that, then the magnetic moment has to come from just the spins, and it turns into that value rather than the experimental value. So this calls into question whether this is the correct Hamiltonian. In fact, it turns out it's not. There's more to it. There's more to it. It's not just the central force Hamiltonian. <coughs> By the way, there's another line of argument that shows you that it cannot be just a central force Hamiltonian. And here's the reason. It's because there's no spin-dependent terms in this system. It's like dealing with hydrogen but leaving out the spin orbit terms. So if we leave out the spin orbit terms, so we just have a central force Hamiltonian like this, then the energy does not depend on the spin state. But we know that the ground state of Deuteron is a spin triplet. Well, it is if it's an S equals, it is if it's an S wave. The fact that these two numbers are close together means that it's not too bad to make this assumption, but it's not perfect. And it means that it means that as a crude model, we can indeed think of the wave function as being an S wave, but there's more to it than that. So based on this crude model, we can say that it's mostly an S wave, but with some kinds of corrections. Well, if it was purely an S wave, and if there's no, and if there's no uh, spin terms in the Hamiltonian, then the triplet state and the singlet state, spin states, would have the same energy. This is just like in hydrogen, if you ignore the spin-spin interaction between the proton and the electron, and in the spin triplet and spin singlet state, but have the same energy. In fact, in hydrogen, they very nearly do. This is called a hyperfine splitting. It's a very small splitting. It comes from the uh, orientation of the proton and electron spins. It's responsible for the, uh, uh, this will be my first lecture next semester, is hyperfine effects in hydrogen. But this is responsible for a splitting of the ground state. This is the 21 centimeter line that's so important in astrophysics. But now here, it's more than 21 centimeters, which is actually quite a small energy in the scale of hydrogen energies. Because what we can see is, is that by flipping the spin, by going to spin singlet state, it must raise the energy by at least 2.2 MeV, because otherwise there would be another bound state that was a spin, a spin singlet. And there is no other bound state. So, and in fact, if there really were no spin orbit terms or any spin dependent terms, then you'd have a degeneracy here because of the ground state, because of the two possible spin values. Okay, so this is all a bunch of indications that this, um, that this simple potential is uh, not completely added. The simple force model for the uh, new one is not completely accurate. No. So, what do we do? Uh, what I do now is uh, I'll tell you about uh, I'll tell you about another experimental fact which appeared in 1939, and this is the fact that the Deuteron possesses a quadrupole moment, electric quadrupole moment. Let me remind you that the quadrupole moment tensor, you have a single particle of charge Q, is the coordinates of that tensor, let me call it, the coordinates of that particle, let me call it x, x i, x j, the coordinates minus delta i j r squared. In the case of the deuteron, there's only the neutron doesn't contribute to the quadrupole moment because it's neutral. So it's, these coordinates are really the proton coordinates. Um, 
Let me remind you also that there's a dipole operator D, which is equal to the charge Q times the position vector of the charge particle. This is for a single charge particle. Uh, when we were looking at the Stark effect, we considered the question of whether uh, whether energy eigenstates could have a permanent electric dipole moment. Let's let's talk about dipole moments first for simplicity. Uh, so if psi is an energy eigenstate, we basically want to look at the matrix elements of the position operator R multiplied by the charge of the electron if you're talking about a single electron atom. This is the average of the electric dipole moment operator. And as we saw, this is always equal to zero because energy eigenstates are eigenstates of parity and the position operator is odd in the parity. Now, however, if I go from a dipole operator to a quadrupole moment operator, the story changes because this is quadratic in the position and therefore it's even in the parity. And so the quadrupole moment operator does connect the other states in identical parity, which we expect the eigenstates to be that because of conservation of parity. And so there's no, uh, there's no parity conservation <coughs> to exclude electric dipole moments of energy eigenstates. Now here's another issue which arises. Is, as I mentioned, the deuteron has this n i equals 1. That's the total angular momentum of the system. Um, when you, that means that the ground state is a, is a, is a irreducible subspace on the rotation is a dimension 3. It's in the magnetic quantum numbers go 0, minus 1, plus 1. And um, it means that on that subspace, the ground, the ground state subspace of the Deuteron system, it means that the possible uh, irreducible tensor operators are, are, or if I write them as TKQ in our usual notation, that the allowed values of K can only be 0, 1, and 2. That comes from adding or crossing 1 cross 1, which gives us 0 plus 1 plus 2. And the 1 here refers to the spin of the Deuteron. So this is part of the homework problem, to find the maximum k that was allowed in a particular subspace like this. It's actually twice, twice, the, twice the spin. So in particular, um, very useful tensor operators with e equals 2 are allowed in spin one, uh, spin 1 system. They're not allowed in spin 1 half system. That means that, for example, the proton or the, uh, the triton, which is the third, the, he the heaviest isotope of hydrogen, the triton is that two neutrons and one proton, so it's kind of like this, one step up from the deuteron. This had actually has a spin of one half, not spin, well, it has to be odd, half integer, but it turns out to be one half. And uh, since it's one half, the maximum uh, irreducible tensor operator, maximum rank of an irreducible tensor operator for the triton system is one. So the triton can, can and does have a magnetic moment, but it does not have an electric quadruple moment. Deuteron, however, is allowed to have an electric quadrupole moment, and it was discovered experimentally by Rob Amy's group in the late 1930s that, in fact, it does. They found this by looking at the energy levels and saw that it was necessary to have a um, have, uh, quadrupole term included. All right. Now, given the fact then, that the Deuteron has an electric quadrupole moment, what can we say about the wave function? What this means is, is that if I take the wave function, whatever it is, and sandwich it on the quadrupole moment operator, we have to get a non-zero answer. Well, the quadrupole moment operator is a t 2q operator, as you know, k equals q. And if psi were purely an s wave, so that this had l equals zero, also it's a purely orbital op op operator, it only involves orbital degrees of freedom, then by the figure of Eckhart theorem, you see the matrix element has to be zero. This has to be equal zero in an s wave because you can't combine zero with two and get an answer of zero. You zero, see two cross with zero just equals, just equals two. So the answer, the answer is zero. And therefore, in order to get a, um, in order to get a non-vanishing quadrupole moment, it's necessary to the higher values of L. And so the ground state wave function of the neuron must include not only L equals zero, but also higher values of L. So let's do this. Then let's take the ground state, let me call it size, the ground state of the, the neutron. And let me write it as an expansion over L, L equals zero to infinity of some coefficients I'll call AL, and then size of L. And the idea here is, is that we take this state psi and we project it onto the various subspaces of, of angular momentum L. And uh, so, like this. 
you project it on the subspace like this. And then psi L is a normalized vector inside that subspace, and the coefficient gives us the magnitude of the projection. So this is this is when they understand that psi L, psi L is equal to one. <coughs> And then the A sub L's are the expansion coefficients, and by, by, by probability conservation, you've got the sum on right? L of A L S the value squared must be equal to 1, these probabilities. All right. Now, um, it turns out we can get some restrictions on which L values are allowed by considering further symmetry principles. Let's look at the <coughs> parity. It's quite easy to look at. If I take parity and allow it to act, act on the ground state, Ground state must be an eigenstate of parity. So the answer has to turn out to be plus or minus one. You may not know which it is, but it has to be one of those two choices, multiplied psi. On the other hand, if we take this expansion and apply, and apply parity, the states with the angular root of L are parity of minus one to the L, basic rule of central force motion. So this now becomes a sum on L of minus one to the L times the same coefficients A L times these projected uh, vectors psi L like this. We know that A0 is not equal to 0 because our original model, in which we had uh, central force Hamiltonian, led us to the conclusion that it was an S wave. And even if it didn't work perfectly, it worked pretty well. We didn't be magnetic moment. So there must be a strong component of an, L of an S wave in the Deuteron wave function, even if that's not all there is. So in particular, the A L equals 0 term ends up with a plus sign here. And the only way that that can equal the total, the total wave function size is if the overall parity is equal to plus one. So we find the neutralized of parity of plus one is even, even parity. But there's something else that happens too. If you look at the L equals one wave, then the minus one of the L introduces is a minus one. And that's not consistent with, those, with this expansion unless those terms vanish. So what we conclude by conservation of parity is that AL is equal to zero as L is odd. Now, so the sum has to so that sum has to be only over even. So it starts with an S wave, then a D wave, and does it go on? Well, the answer is it does not go on because uh, we can't have L greater than two. If we had L equals four, for example, then the maximum spin we can get is one, and if you combine them together, the minimum value of I would be I equals three. But this is wrong because we know I is equal to one. And so, in fact, the sum terminates at L equals 2. And thus, from looking at parity, we reach the conclusion, I'll put it right here, is that the ground state of Deuteron must be some coefficient, let's call it A0, times a normalized vector in the L equals 0 subspace, plus A, a sub 2 times a normalized vector in the L equals 2 subspace. It's a combination of an S wave and a D wave, and that's all. Now the question is, what about these two coefficients? And now, I'd like to show you, I clearly won't have time to finish this. I'll just go to the beginning of it. I'll show you how, by, by using this magnetic moment data, there will be this disagreement here between the simpler model where it's pure S wave. Now what we're going to do is improve on this and consider this linear combination of S waves and D waves and see if we can get the magnetic moment to, uh, by using the experimental which has now been erased. This was the theoretical result on that simple model, which didn't agree with the experiment. By, by having a more sophisticated model that includes a D wave to try to determine what the coefficients are. Turns out you can't get the coefficients themselves, but you can get their squares. Of the, you can get the squares of the, uh, of the uh, whereas if the A0 and the A2, these are the two unknown numbers here. All right. So uh, let's work on this now. <clears throat> Isn't it the wave, the wave function that we just saw for it? That's the wave function of the combined state of the proton and the neutron? Yes, it's actually the relative wave function. Of course, there's a set of mass wave function, too, but that's, okay. that's trivial, so we don't count that. Yes. So, um, so uh, the, uh, we'll do it like this. Uh, we'll again use magnetic moment information. Let me remind you that in the Zeeman effect in a single electron, uh, uh, single electron atom, we had a perturbing Hamiltonian, we call it delta H, for the interaction with the magnetic field. I think previously I called it the Zeeman Hamiltonian, HZ, uh, which is uh, 
which was which was this. It was um, mu sub dv, uh, and then this was multiplied times uh, L sub z plus plus S sub z. Uh, the orbital and spin angular momentum momentum contribute in unequal proportions to the magnetic moment. And the reason is that there's an effective g factor of one for the orbital motion and a g factor of two for the spin. That's this, this is too early as this is the g factor of the electron. The electron spin in direct direct out. This is for the this is for the case of, of, a, of a hydrogen atom. Now, in the case of the deuteron, it's going to look like this. It's going to be first of all a nuclear magneton times the magnetic field. There's also a minus sign because the particles are positively charged, protonless. And uh, it turns out to be the following. In the first place, there's an effective G factor, not of one, but rather of one half. And the reason it is one half instead of one is because in hydrogen, the proton is massive, so the electron is moving around and the proton is mostly stationary. Whereas in, in the deuteron, both the proton and the neutron are orbiting around each other and the distance from, from either particle to the center of mass is one half of the distance between the particles. So there's an analysis one can go through uh, in which you transform from the laboratory to center of mass variables. For lack of time, I won't go through this. But when the smoke clears, you find that there's a g factor of one half for the orbital angular momentum in the case of the deuteron. And as far as the spin is concerned, these are the same things we wrote down earlier. It's g proton times s1z plus g neutron times s2z. And now what we want to do is to sandwich this, this um, Zeeman Hamiltonian between uh, the psi here, which refers to the ground state wave function, which refers to this linear combination up here, projected on the two angular momentum states. Uh, to be a little more specific about those two angular momentum states, psi zero and psi two, let me let me write them out. Uh, so psi zero. Uh, allow me to let me, allow me to write states this way in terms of the following quantum numbers: L, S, I, and M sub I. Let's let those be the quantum numbers. Then psi zero is a quantum number in which the orbital angular momentum is zero. That's what the zero here refers to. The spin has to equal one because that's the only way you can get the total total. Uh, experimental spin of the deuteron to come out when L is equal to zero. I is equal to one, that's that's the value of the spin of the deuteron, and then MI is any, any, any number in there. As far as psi two is concerned, this is a D wave, so L is equal to two. The spin is still equal to one. You combine two with one in order to get a final total value of one, and then survive like this. If you prefer to think about this in terms of wave functions, the first one is the same wave function I wrote down earlier, which is now disappearing. This is, let's call it R0 of R. It's a radial wave function times a Y0 zero, zero. And then for the spins, what we've got is S and, and M sub S, where M sub S is equal to M sub I, and the same thing on the two sides. And the S is equal to 1. So S and M sub S are the triplet states that are made out of uh, out of this, the, uh, the two spins of the particles added together. Now, in psi 2, what do we have is we've got a, a different radial wave function, R2 of R. And now what we need to do is to use Clutch Gordon coefficients to combine orbital and spin angular momentum with orbital 2 and spin 1 to create a total final angular momentum of R. So let me write this this way as a sum on ML and MS. Uh, y sub 2L of uh, solid angle theta phi. Then the spin state will be uh, spin 1 and then m sub s. So this is equal to spin. And then we have clutch Gordon coefficients. Good grief, I'm out of time. We have clutch Gordon coefficients, which is going to be 2, uh, two 1 uh, uh, ML ms. And the final j i values are, are, are uh, i and m sub i where i here is equal to 1, like this. So explicitly in terms of adding orbital and spin angle, we only get these two states. 
Okay, uh, so I, I, we've taken probably another half hour really to go through, take this all the way through. Let me just say that when you finally do this, you can actually calculate. Um, you need to use the projection there about three or four times in order to evaluate the shift uh, of the uh, of the deuteron in the presence of the external magnetic field, including the orbital angular effects. And taking into account that it's a linear combination of two different L values. And anyway, then you get an equation you can solve, and here's what you get is you get A0 squared is equal to 0 0.956, and you get A2 squared is equal to 0 0.044. So the deuteron wave function has about a 4% probability of being in a D wave and about 96% of being in an S wave. This is the Okay, uh, well, that's the end of the semester. I have a couple of announcements. I have here a memory stick with... Uh